So here we are <laughs> gathering at the end of the year to say, whoop de doo for God. And it looks like it's the same old, same old world that we've always lived in and that nothing really is working out quite right. But look at the gospel lesson. John's gospel, we think, is written late first century, somewhere between 90 and 95 AD. It's written at a time when the emperor Domitian it has begun again a fairly serious persecution of Christian folks, feeding them to the lions, boiling them in oil. French right Christians are really not very nice. So here's this persecution going on, and he writes a gospel. He spends the first half talking about the things that Jesus does. He calls them not miracles, but signs, always pointing beyond what happened to something greater. And then beginning in chapter 12, for the last week of Jesus' life, he says, now is the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. And if you look at the passion in the Gospel of John, there is no anguished prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not there. Instead, Judas comes with a band of people and Jesus says, whom are you looking for? They say Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, the translation doesn't help it, he said, help us, he says, I am, and they all fall flat. I am says, I am God. That was God's name in the Old Testament. I am. He's in charge. When he is examined before the high priest, they bring up all kinds of witnesses, and Jesus is the one who asks them questions. And now, with Pilate, Pilate says, I'm the guy in charge here. Are you a king? Did you say that of your own accord, or did someone tell you that? He is again in charge of what's going on. Why would a writer do that? Because he wants to say to people who are facing life that is sometimes less than delightful, here is Jesus facing life that is less than delightful. It will cost him his life. And he says, this is the reason I came. I'm the one who knows what I'm doing. This is not an accident. This is something that was designed so that I can show a world that has the money to kill people but not to feed them, that that's not what God had in mind. And so he stands before Pilate and says, I'm in charge. So that we who read that then can go back at the lives that we live that are less than delightful and say, all right, how do we live? Yes, Family and friends still die, and we get sick, and we have more than colds, and sometimes it will be terminal. Finally, all of us will not escape this world alive, barring the coming of Christ. But uh, with that happening, we still say we live with a vision that says we know someone who dared to run the risk of entering into death ahead of us and rising victoriously over it. That the worst that the world can do to us is finally to kill us, and some disease may do that. But when it's all said and done, Christ is still the one who is king, and Christ is the one who says, I have the power to raise you back to life, and demonstrated that. And about the people who are hungry, for whom poverty is running rampant. Do we say, oh, this is a global problem, it's way too big, we can't deal with $44 billion, I don't have that in my wallet, not even in any number of years. But we live, we live with the idea, with the promise of the one who is king. And as that one said, take care of the widows and the orphans, be concerned about people who are less fortunate, then in a world that says, yes, we've got the money to go to war and kill people, no, we don't have the money to feed people, then we say, wrong. 
and we write letters as we did last week, and they will be presented as part of our offering today. We write letters to our Congress people to say, look, this is not how the world is supposed to be. And Congress will say, well, yeah, that's a nice idea, but no, right. The information that Bread for the World gives us is that as more and more people write to their Congress people, their senators and representatives, that change does in fact happen. No, we will not cough up 44 billion, and no, we will not suddenly stop war so that we have the money to do that. But it's a beginning, it's a process. And we, as the people of God who know Christ as King, live with that kind of vision that says, we know what should be happening. It may kill us trying to get it done, but we will live with that vision because we know the God who has demonstrated in Christ that he is the one who really is king. So we go back to our lives and we say, keep on going. Yes, sometimes you will, we will have to grit our teeth. Yes, sometimes things will not always work out, but we still know I know in whose hands I am held. It's the one who gave his life for us. Amen. <laughs>